Um, hello, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm James Kirk, I'm the director of the Social Market Foundation. Um, you are, um, I hope you know, here for this uh, SNF, uh, SME for Labour combined fringe event on gambling reform, gambling policy. Um, uh, some housekeeping before we get started. The camera up there, hello the camera, is, I think I'm right, someone correct me if I'm wrong, live streaming this event. Uh, so when we get to questions, I hope you'll have questions and thoughts and comments later, uh, then uh, you will, uh, your questions will be live streamed to the whole of the internet um, uh, now and in perpetuity because I think the videos of the event will stay on. Uh, is it good? Is it, are we going to YouTube? Anybody? Yeah. So Twitter, Twitter. So the, video, the, video, the point is the video. The video of the session stays stays online forever. So while it's a cosy, it's a cosy conversation between those of us here, but you also you also have a permanent internal online audience as well. Um, uh, apologies for starting a little late, by the way, but that's that's far from conference for you. Um, uh, you um, so in terms of running order, in a minute I will shut off. Um, these two here. Um, I'm going to hand over then to Alan Harris, MP, uh, without whom <coughs> the discussion or uh, debate about gambling policy is complete. Um, the issue many things, uh, including the chair of the APPG on gambling related harm. Um, uh, it's a pretty quick group of factors with the SMF. The SMF, if you don't know, is we are a cross party think tank. Um, so we might work with APPG, which are cross party organisations. Um, our policy interest in this matter, which we'll get to in due course, um, is obviously, as the name is in social market foundation. We're interested in markets, we like markets, we're just, we're just aware that they exist in a social context. And there is a role for the state ensuring that mar markets work properly for the people in them, which is the starting premise of this whole conversation. Um, uh, so after we hear a little from Carolyn, uh, we then get the lead uh, juror from uh, Professor Henrietta Bowden Jones. The NHS National Problem Gambling Clinic. Um, uh, so we get to the full facts and figures about gambling harm, treatment of it, and what can be done to, uh, I think I'm right saying, what we've done to raise more funds for better treatment. Oh, and what's possible preempting? Am I preempting your, 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 your comments there? Um, forgive me. Um, I'll then hand over to uh, my colleague at the SMF, Dr. James Noyes, Senior Fellow of the Social Market Foundation. I think if you're, if you're particular aficionados of this subject, you'll have read his. Uh, sensational roller coaster report on uh, suggestions for gambling reform in the context of the ongoing review of the 2005 Gambling Act uh, that was published uh, slightly over a year ago, in fact. Um, uh, and then finally, we are going to hear from Matt Zard Cousins uh, of uh, the EU Clean Up Gambling. I'm not going to finish off on the dare I say, some, more, some more political points, but the changing aspects of the we are, you know, we are a political gathering. This is a, a political question as well as, a, as, well as one for, uh, for, for policy wonks. So uh, that's about it, I think, in terms of the preamble. Um, uh, I'll hear from you all. We'll talk again when we get to the, you know, the, 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 questions, the, the questions in the comments sections. Um, so I'm going to, sorry. Yes, forgive me. I, I've been doing Zoom for a long time. I was literally about to press the button for myself on Zoom yeah. um, <laughs> and have over to Carolyn. So I can't do that. I can just literally shut my mouth. Probably better put me on it before I start. <laughs> um, thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, it's always really, really encouraging when we see so many people turning up to your, what we've got to say about gambling. And I think the, the biggest point I need to make to everybody in this room is that the AP, neither the APBG, anyone on it, or the principle of the APBG has ever been about being anti-gambling. It's never been about being anti-gambling. It's about being protective of the vulnerable people who, for whatever reason, find themselves unable to control their gambling. And there'll be many reasons for that. And most of them will be based in mental or public health problems. But the activity themselves is not something that they do willfully. Um, it's something that they cannot stop themselves from doing. It's really important that I make that point. Um, Matt and I started this probably back in 20, it was one of the first things we locked up when I became an MP. Um, and it was about the fixed odds betting terminals. And throughout the time that we were locking up the fixed odds betting terminals, people kept saying to me, you need to lock it online. And I kept saying, well, maybe that's a campaign for someone else, not me. I'll just deal with the fixed odds betting terminals. Um, but throughout that period, we were getting 
daily emails, phone calls, letters. Terrible, terrible stories about people who are being exploited by an industry that was just making obscene amounts of money and didn't seem to understand that the vulnerability of these people was leading them to situations which were way beyond their control. Not only the, the fact they were gambling, the fact that they were in many cases stealing money to gamble, but the irretrievable breakdown of families, homelessness, desperation, loss of self-respect, no self-control, and more tragically, loss of life. Now, I am deeply concerned about the number of people who reach that point in their gambling where they're unable to control it, accept it, or move forward from it, and they end up taking their life. And there's a lot of parents out there who, whether their child is, is two or 62, as a parent who's lost a child, I know what that feels like. And when you're able to attribute that back to something which we as parliamentarians and we as morally correct people could do something about, I think it's really important that we're in a position to change a system to protect people, then it's our duty to do so. So I've been on a bit of a cru crusade for a while and, and it's probably not made me very popular with some people. And in the beginning, it used to worry me. Now I don't give a bugger. I say, bring it on. If you don't like me, that's tough. Because I, what I've discovered is that unless I say what I think and say what I want to do, and that's to protect vulnerable people, there will always be people out there, predominantly from the industry, who will try to say that I'm a prohibitionist, I'm anti-gambling, I've been called a Methodist. I come from Wales. That's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> no. So to call me a Methodist, to say that because I am, have an interest in protecting vulnerable people makes me um, some kind of, right. like, you know, Bible puncher, for want of a better expression, is so immature and naive, it's unbelievable. You know, if I have, I mean, I have, I have got a faith, but what's that going to do with my interest in, in gambling? Absolutely nothing. It's right. about being a decent human being and recognising that we are dealing here with an industry that cares far more about profit than it does about people. And that's my reason for living has been to make sure that we get the government to acknowledge that whilst there is no issue with people who can go to the bingo, can buy a lottery ticket, can go to the bookies, can go online, can do anything related to gambling, if they can walk away from that activity with their home, their finances, their integrity, their self-respect and their life intact, then I've got a problem with it. But for that, that section of society, who the industry will say are the minority, and if I tell you that that minority makes the majority of the profit for the, that industry, then maybe you'll understand just how insidious this industry is. I don't want to see it expelled to outer space, I just want to see it in a place where there is checks and measures put in place that we can protect those who are unable to protect themselves. And I've been very critical of organisations who take money from the industry because I do not believe that you can be neutral and you can be independent and you can actually provide recovery and research services for an addiction if you take in the, the hand that feeds you is actually making money off the back of the of people. So I have been critical about it. I've been critical about the Gambling Commission um, on more than one occasion. They've then now under a new regime and let's hope that things are better there. I have been critical of all the organisations, like I said, like Gamble Aware and why Gamble all these organisations. I continue to be critical of them because any organisation which can promote the industry and say that they are doing all they can to support vulnerable people, well then they need to wake up and smell the coffee because they're not. And I will continue to press those buttons. So happy to take any questions. If you've never heard of me before, you may never want to hear from me again. But if you, are, if you have got a cause that you think needs to be locked at, and gambling is certainly one of them, then I'm the girl because, you know, I've worked cross party on this, I've got no fear from the industry and I've got no fear from what I say is not the truth because I know it is. And that's all I'm going to say. Thank you very much, Barbara. We'll do questions after we've had all, all the panelists. On, on your, your point that Methodist being, being in so much, <laughs> yeah. I should declare at this one, I suppose.
Uh, I actually, I, I, was, I, was, I was brought up to the Brethren. Um, uh, I remember once, once I was a very, very long time ago, that elderly relative once said to him that I will be after the Methodists. So they're very yeah. well, very worldly. Um, <laughs> so I should tell them not to don't practice anymore. It doesn't inform my views of the subject. But, um, uh, but I'm very interested. You talk, you talk about control there. I'm going to use that to hand over to you, to, to, to Henrietta, because um, I mean, that's the reason we're very interested in the subject at the SMF. Because obviously, there's a traditional view of markets which says that essentially people go out and they spend their money in the most rational way. You know, they choose where they, you know, sometimes some people might buy, but you know, if you, if you work here at Columbus University, you learn you either buy, buy, buy guns or butter. I'm not quite sure why it's I buy one. Yeah. Um, yeah. By, guns, by guns or butter, you, you allocate your money in, in, in a way that makes, makes your life better. Uh, and that's a rational choice. And there's a big school of thought which says, yeah, governments shouldn't really get in the way of that process. I uh, guess we're interested in this because you know, this is a market where you can go and buy a product, you can choose to allocate your money, uh, and there's a real question about how freely you are doing that. How many, you know, and you said control is really important work. So I, at this point, I'm going to hand over to Henrietta, who knows essentially exactly to, 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 to your nanomolecule, what's going on in all our brains at the moment, she's a neuroscientist. Uh, you, can, you can talk to us a little bit about the, the science of behavior around gambling, what it does to our brains, and therefore you know, the problems that arise, and what can be done to address those, those problems. So, um, Henry, Thank you. If I, if I, I'm a non scientist, forgive me if, I, if, I, if I've misunderstood the, the business of neuroscience. Um, but. So, the first thing I'd like to do is to, is to express a, a deeply felt thank you uh, to Carolyn, to the APPG on Gambling Harm to Matt uh, and to James for the uh, tireless and very brave, and I will say brave, work that they have been persevering with uh, all the way back to the FOBT campaign. I can tell you now that being the person who started the first ever NHS clinic, the National Problem Gambling Clinic, we were living in a landscape where uh, experts by experience didn't have a voice. Uh, where clinicians uh, didn't feel anyone was listening and where there was a fragmented approach which suited some people very well uh, but didn't suit anyone who wanted to protect the vulnerable from gambling harm and it was that campaign and it was the result of that campaign that made people who cared uh, feel that it was possible to implement change even in a, in a society that is so financially driven as ours is. Uh, and those repercussions of what happened in England, uh, they went global. You know, everywhere I go, when I go to international meetings, people still talk to me about the campaign of FOBT, uh, state reduction, and the unification of uh, excess by experience, researchers, treatment people, politicians, and the general public who want to, to protect their children and, and their vulnerable. So I do feel that we need to recognize this openly and publicly, and indeed all that is happening now in relation to the next steps in order to get what is essentially a gambling app that is fit for our age. Uh, at the moment it isn't, as we all know. Um, I will just mention briefly, I, I won't talk about treatment now, but people are welcome to ask me questions. What I do want to say is that having been in this field now, uh, for almost 20 years, because of course before setting up the clinic, I was researching gambling, I was already um, uh, uh, preparing to set up the clinic, which took a few years. So I will say the first thing for me is really about a statutory levy. I can tell you now, having been on the other end of the experience of voluntary contributions, that it is only with a statutory levy that we will have absolute freedom, not just to treat uh, patients as many as we need with an evidence-based approach and thank you for the nice guidelines that are now uh, being pulled together and will be ready by 2024. Um, we will by then have the proper evidence base but still now the most important thing is that we need, uh, we need a very clear statutory levy to give independent funds to research. In this country we have some of the best neuroscientists uh, in the world, they cannot they cannot do any gambling research, or particularly certainly nothing of a magnitude, because they don't have those funds. Not that many people are interested in gambling outside of rooms like these, and that's a problem. 
Uh, we need independent funding for treatment. We certainly need independent funding for public health interventions. And if you want to ask why, just think of the tobacco industry and how they infiltrated every layer of society and every layer of research during those years. So we need to protect the gambling field from now on from that. I also feel that um, uh, whilst we talk about public health, I would like to see a, a far greater involvement of health in any decision making about gambling. I think it's been dire the way that they have been, uh, uh, for whatever reason, and I'm not making any political, political statements here, health has not been at the table in the way it should have been. Uh, we, we, the clinicians, have been very, very privileged and we've been participating in gambling-related decisions now for some time at a very low level. But health, right at the top, needs to be hand-in-hand hand with DCMS if DCMS is to continue in its role. And I'm happy to take questions on that. Um, I'll just mention briefly, we've got a, a, um, an enormous problem with things like uh, Twitter, for example. All of us are on Twitter, we converse on Twitter, we, we share on Twitter, but uh, so are an enormous amount of children. So we know that 41,000 children in 2019 followed gambling-related accounts. How can that be in the same day and age when we have so much ability to uh, to um, put a new software that will block this? So this is urgent, absolutely urgent. Gambling blocks by default, um, I think, needs to be addressed in the gambling act. Um, I have the words of the Bishop of St Albans, who has done so much um, with the House of Lords for gambling, preventing prevention of harm, a generational scandal, he called it, and I would really, really agree with that. I won't go into the statistics, I can do later if you want. I think there is an enormous job to be done on advertising. I don't even need to start here to tell you, as you've all experienced it how many people are being bombarded by gambling adverts, and not just on television. If you think of the internet, if you think of social media, and you think of all the people who are being uh, enticed into an activity they often didn't know anything about. Um, I will just finish with a couple of points. I think affordability checks are vital. Uh, every day, every week, every month, I have so many people who have spent what they would earn in a lifetime, but they spent it in a couple of months. Uh, that is just crazy and can be prevented. So let's make sure that it does get prevented. Uh, so financial checks are vital. The work of loot boxes is vital. People need to come to a decision. We've been waiting for that. I think more repercussions on industry if people are not protected adequately. I don't think it's been done enough by the Gambling Commission. An ombudsman. Uh, and to start sooner than 2023, and a clear harm index for products so that there are repercussions and there are also um, uh, monitoring of activities in relation to harm. And that's me done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. You, you actually provided a perfect segue into the contribution of my SMF colleague, Jamie Norris, uh, who's uh, report that I mentioned uh, published last year, uh, which it fills, it fills in a lot of the all those gaps and uh, you, you, you point out you've raised about the structure and the, uh, the way in which gambling policy should be should be made and implemented. Um, uh, so I'll hand over to James now. I get us into some of the legislative and, uh, and policy context and so forth. James. Thanks, James. Dr. Dr. James. Yeah, James. otherwise... Uh, call, otherwise call, him Dr. You call me James, call him Dr. James. Yeah, otherwise saying I'm doing the boring bit, I'm afraid. Um, so James said I've got five minutes. I timed it this morning. It lasts for four, so please be patient. <laughs> and, uh, it will get very boring, but there is an end to it. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about the work that we've done in the SMF with this report we published last year. Some of the wider policy context that led up to the Gambling Act review and how I think that context still applies today as we lead up to the, to the white paper. So as most of you will be uh, well aware of, the government review of the 2005 Gambling Act was launched at the end of last year. And a few months ahead of that, we at the SMF published a report outlining what we thought should be the priorities for that review and the reform of gambling regulation. We published that at around the same time as Carolyn's APPG, and the House of Lords Select Committee reports also came out. So sort of mid, mid summer last year, there was a cluster of large reports. And each of them covered quite similar 
territory looking at a set of policy ideas, Henrietta has already outlined most of them, which include limits to online stakes and prizes, the question of affordability or unaffordability, the funding of research, education and treatment through a statutory levy, the role of the Gambling Commission as, as regulator, the question of consumer protection and customer redress through an ombudsman. And in my report, I also looked at some of the questions around the taxation of online gambling operators, the regulation of offshore companies, how to get these companies, some of which operate out of tax havens, to contribute more to the British economy, to share some of the load, if you like, and also the wider regulatory framework, where the Gambling Commission sits in terms of other regulators, healthcare providers, and ombudsmen, and how these could be better aligned. Now, not all of the ideas in my report and the reports of the Lord Select Committee and APPG filtered through to the Gambling Act Review, but a good many did. And I think that one of the great achievements of Carolyn's APPG report, the Lord's report, campaigners for reform like Matt's our cousin, and I'd like to think our SMF report, is that when the review was announced, its terms of reference were as broad in their scope as we, as we hoped. It meant that government really is, apparently, looking at the question of gambling reform, not just through a small prism of a few technical questions, but in a more ambitious and holistic way. And the signs are that the review is going to lead to meaningful and maybe even radical change. If you go by what has been floated in some of the papers, and we've not been disabused of uh, what has been mentioned in those uh, papers, certain key issues begin to come to the fore. They are the end to shirt sponsorship of football clubs by gambling companies. That's looking like a done deal. The same with the, the infamous white labels. Three others have been named. Limits to online slot stakes, probably at two pounds. An end to so-called VIP schemes and the introduction of an ombudsman. Now, I think there's a noticeable omission to those four key areas of shirt sponsorship, online slot limits, VIP schemes, and ombudsman, in the lack of any mention of a statutory levy and a lack of any mention of affordability checks. Maybe we could discuss some of that this afternoon. In my opinion, this omission would be a mistake. The reason given for not having a statutory levy is that DCMS keeps saying that the Treasury isn't a fan of hypothecated taxation. I understand the economic arguments behind why they would say that, but I also took note that earlier this month, when the Prime Minister announced the social care levy, he explicitly said that the revenue from the tax increase from 2023 to 2024 would be hypothecated. The Treasury clearly is a believer of hypothecation under certain circumstances. And it should not be forgotten that the biggest operators have already pledged to provide 1% of their gross gambling yield to research, education and treatment. The money is already pledged by the industry and the Treasury is already open to the principle of hypothecation. So I do uh, feel that DCMS might want to consider revisiting that question and understand that the levy is not about introducing an arbitrary new tax on the sector, but it's about formalising and ring-fencing an existing pledge of funds within that sector so that those funds are allocated and spent properly. I'm conscious of time, so I won't go into the affordability question here, except to say that the way that this question has been spun by the industry lobbyists, I'm afraid to say, describing it as an intrusive and um, nanny statist intervention is a deliberate misinterpretation of the policy question, at least certainly what I was proposing in my report last year. And those of you who are familiar with the report will know that it's where this hundred pounds, famous hundred pounds uh, limit was first introduced, totally misrepresented by the industry. And I'd like to have the chance to talk about that later on during the Q's and A's. I'd like to end uh, with just a few words about what the Labour Party might do going forward. After all, this is the Labour Party conference, and many of you will be aware that I used to be an advisor in this area to the former Shadow Culture Secretary. Gambling reform is a broad church and has always attracted genuine cross-party support. We see that most clearly in Carolyn's APPG and the work that she had pioneered with Ian Duncan Smith and Ronnie Cowan of the SNP. 
One of the most important voices in the debate from a Lords perspective is a Liberal Democrat here, Lord Foster. And surveys show that a majority of parliamentarians and voters from all parties support reform. But I do think it's important to take note that while this gambling review is being led by a Conservative government and enjoys cross-party support, the review itself is very much the legacy of the Labour Party. It's actually the legacy of some of the sitting in the audience today um, who, who, who wrote a fantastic report in 2018. And I think it's of relevance to our discussion today that this review bears all the spots and stripes of Labour. It was brought into being thanks to the work of people like Carolyn and her former colleagues, my former boss. Many of the policy positions in the terms of reference of the review can be traced back to interventions made by these Labour MPs. And so maybe today's question could be reframed to ask not so much how should Labour respond to the government's review as if it's some kind of distant thing being done on another planet, but rather how can Labour ensure that this government review upholds and maintains its own Labour legacy? And to answer that question, I suppose it's useful to go back to some of the first principles of the Labour Party policy agenda in this, in this world. Why should Labour care at all about gambling? And when you look at some of those policy areas that we're going to discuss today, you will see certain key themes. The themes of debt, financial harm, economic disadvantage and deprivation. The theme of addiction, health harm, the relationship between products and public health. The question of the balance of regulation, as James mentioned, the extent of the state's intervention in the market, questions of data and privacy, online harms, surveillance capitalism, the taxation of companies which sometimes have operations offshore. How does that apply when we think of the digital services tax? Questions of the monopolization of a market, a market of big multinational players through mergers and acquisitions, questions of competition more. Questions of football, money from advertising and sport, the list goes on. Gambling is like a window through which we can see a whole nexus of interlocking issues pertaining to capital, the state, and harm. And I think it's really important to remember that in 2018 and 2019, Labour put together an ambitious programme which captured these issues and put forward a series of policy recommendations articulated in the manifesto which informed the terms of reference of the subsequent Gambling Act review. So I, to end, my advice to the Labour Party, if they want to listen to what I have to say on this question, would be twofold. First, keep in mind that big picture. Encourage government to approach the question of gambling reform in a holistic, creative and ambitious way. We have the Gambling Act review. We also have a review of online safety, the draft bill. And we have a review of football governance. The Gambling Commission and the Information Commissioner's Office are collaborating on questions of data and privacy. The CMA has also looked at these questions. The NHS has an addiction strategy. The majority of these various regulators and reviews have oversight under the same department, DCMS. So I think there's a pretty clear window of opportunity for today's shadow DCMS team to think creatively and ambitiously and identify opportunities of how to connect these things so that they speak to each other and don't just go off in different directions. And second, it seems to me that Labour could do more to own its own legacy in this area. Identify the policy priorities in the review's call for evidence and draw on the work for the past five years to hold the review and the government to proper scrutiny. I think that when the white paper comes out in the next couple of months, that surely was, but hopefully will will happen. So the gamma reform is not just something that matters to the party in the past, but also matters in the future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. James. Uh, everyone's been, been very, very helpful in the panel today for setting up the uh, setting the stage for the, for the person falling after them. So uh, James brought us back there to the Labour Party and the some more politically facing questions that arise from Gamma, which is a very good way to hand over to Matt Zar cousin, who as I'm sure you know used to run the Labour Party, um, uh, from uh, now running Clean Up Gambling. 
um, to tell us about the, uh, I guess, the campaign, public-facing aspects of, uh, of this. Where, where should campaigners and um, politicians go, go with this matter? Well, thanks, James. Um, so the first thing I'd say is this is a really popular agenda, um, and some of the policies and proposals that have been put forward in the reports that James has mentioned and by the cross-party groups in Parliament, um, Carolyn's group and uh, Peers for Gambling Reform, all of these policies have overwhelming public support. And in fact, the MPs in Parliament, if you look at the polling of MPs, they are even more in favour of these policies. So what Carolyn has done in Parliament um, with IDS and Ronnie brings all sorts of people together, this agenda, um, is phenomenal and it's, there's overwhelming support in Parliament and in the House of Lords. And there's also overwhelming support in the media. So because of the Fogarty campaign and because of the way I think that the gambling industry behaved in that campaign, where they, on successive occasions, tried to shut down news stories about um, about fixed loss betting terminals, used very, very aggressive legal threats and tactics that really got editors' backs up. Um, just meant that their natural kind of opposition to this type of gambling and this type of um, product in betting shops became, uh, I think, much, much, much stronger, much stronger kind of anti-gambling or anti-gambling industry sentiment across every single newspaper. So that's the first, that's the second thing. The points that James has made, Dr. James, about uh, the Labour Party, this being the Labour Party's agenda, the Labour Party's legacy, we're about, to, I think we're about three or three months away from the white paper. And in that will be obviously the government's recommendations on, in the gambling review. And I am pretty sure uh, given the direction of travel, given how popular the agenda is with the public, in Parliament, in the media, there is absolutely no question that the vast majority of the things that we have been calling for are going to happen. And at that point, the Labour Party needs to be in a position where it can take credit for this being their agenda. And at the moment, it is only really Carolyn and, I mean, look, it's obviously a substantial amount of MPs that are supportive of the agenda, but I feel, I feel like Labour are missing an opportunity because the government's going to adopt their policies and they're not saying anything about it, and uh, apart from current. So I, th I think it's, it's in their interest to try to own this and make sure that they own this. Um, and, they, and that was really the inspiration for a lot of their interest in this particular policy area was the fact that they did feel responsible for the 2005 Gambling Act and the fact that the, you know, it, did liberal, it was a liberalising piece of legislation. Obviously, that was passed before we had smartphones um, and a lot's changed since then, a lot's changed in the world. Uh, but there was a sense that Labour, the Labour Party was responsible for all the problems that gambling was causing society because of poor regulation and poor legislation. So we need to do something about it on the front foot. Um, and since then, since the 2005 Act, lots has changed, obviously, lots has changed with technology. But the thing that I think is most significant probably happened in 2011, when the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders shifted gambling from being considered an impulse control disorder to an addiction on the part of drugs and alcohol. And then when you are looking at it through that prism, you are talking about you are talking about addiction and you're talking about products that are inherently addictive. And you're talking about an industry that derives, depending on what estimate you look at, between 60 and 80 percent of its profits from the five percent of people that are either addicted or at risk. So that's six between sixty and eighty percent. So when James, uh, when James Kirkup was talking earlier about the logic of the market, or alluding to the logic of the market, 
you have an antagonism between the consumer and the vendor in gambling. It's quite unique, I think, in that respect. One wins and one loses. One hands over money and the other doesn't get anything back. It's very unique and therefore you do need quite a significant amount of regulation and intervention to make that fair, to make that relationship fair. And the mistake that was made in 2005, in 2005 Gambling Act, was to apply the principles of regulation, the neo, sorry to use this word, because I know it's like, the neoliberal principles of regulation to something like gambling, because unfortunately it doesn't, it just doesn't work. You can't have a light touch approach to regulating gambling, um, precisely for the reason I just outlined. And what's happened is the gambling industry is now, Britain is the biggest regulated gambling market in the world, right? so it's, it's massive here. And the gambling industry has basically been allowed to do what it wants. And when it has been, when there's been particularly egregious instances of bad behavior, they've been fined by the regulator. The fines are a cost of doing business. Nothing is changing. So you have, um, so they really can't believe their luck at how easy they've had it. And I'll give you an example, right? So Flutter, uh, which is the holding company of um, Skybet, Betfair, Paddy Power. They're trying to get licensed in various US states, obviously, because that's the next frontier. It's everyone, all the big operators now trying to get licensed in the US. And in New York, they've just, they've just um, Cuomo, the governor, has said that they're going to legalize online gambling and they're only going to have 15 licenses. They're going to license 15 operators and contrast that with Britain, where we have about 2,000 online gambling licenses, right? So Corona said 50. The minimum rate of tax will be 50, 50%. And you've all got to basically compete with each other in a race to the top to convince us to license you. And Flutter have gone, oh, 50% tax, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, when they put the tax up here from 15% to 21%, and they avoid corporation tax by being based in, uh, in, in Ireland. Uh, and many of these big operators avoid corporation tax. Entain is based in the Isle of Man. Uh, then you've got William Hill based in Gibraltar. Uh, the, there's, I think that actually only Bet365 pays corp UK corporation tax. I mean, that's how bad it is. And we've allowed this situation to happen. Um, so you look at something like that, where like basically you're looking at the US and the, all these operators trying to get licensed in the US, and they're happy to do all of these things, to jump, jump through all these hoops, because we have allowed them to get away with stuff, this stuff for far, far too long, and we absolutely can push, push the regulation much further in the interest of consumer protection. Um, so that was the... I mean, that, that, that's something that I think that the government as well is probably taking note of, is the fact that you know, they're, they're quite happy to bend over backwards, have the, the server, have all of their operational functions, have pay the tax, um, only license sports books, sports betting, and, and not, casino, not online casino, all in the state in order to get licensed in the US. And here, they just basically do what they want. Um, so look, the government, I think, is, is really coming around to this view that this sector is causing a huge amount of harm to the public. It's, uh, it's ex basically, we, we export billions to these tax havens where these firms are based, and we import loads of gambling-related harm and all the associated costs. So it becomes very difficult, I think, to defend that. That's not a satisfactory situation whatsoever. Um, and I think that that is where the key, there's a key difference between the campaign for online gambling reform and the Fobberty campaign, because at least the betting industry with the Fobberties could say, well, we employ all these people and we pay rates and, you know, we've got nice. I mean, obviously the economic argument um, wasn't particularly strong because that money would always be recycled in the economy anyway, but, you know, the, at least they had that argument. Well, what are they going to say? What are they saying now about the jobs they create? We, we create a lot of jobs in tax havens. 
I mean, or you know, we don't buy, we don't, we, we avoid UK corporation tax. You know, we pay twenty one percent gross uh, duty on our gross revenue, uh, and we moan about it. And then we go to New York and we say, yeah, we're happy to pay pay fifty percent. I just feel like the, the country has been taken for a ride by these companies and that reckoning is going to happen very soon. Thank you very much. I'm not your real problem, but neoliberalism. Fair to say, the, the, the iron yes of capable accused of neoliberalism. We would correctly say we prefer all neoliberalism for uh, students of German, German economic theories. <laughs> um, so we've had uh, you know, a rich contributions from the panel there. I'm going to turn to all of you now for thoughts, questions. Are you, are you all want to go first? I've, I've, got, I've got a bunch of questions. Like, uh, I can ask if, if everybody's feeling shy, but I'm, I'm sure uh, a hand has gone up. Gentlemen, in the lovely spot of time. Uh, tell us who you are. You need to talk your question. Question, comment, thought. Hey, well, thank, thanks very much. Uh, my name is Tom McNeil. I'm the Assistant Police and Crime Commissioner for the West Midlands. And um, <laughs> uh, thanks. <laughs> um, not sure what I've been to do that. I'll take that. Um, we're very, very interested in addiction, full stop, and public health approaches to it. We're really, really trying to champion that in many ways. When we look at things around substance misuse, for example, like has been alluded to by the panel, it's very often intertwined with lots of other social challenges. You know, often just poverty, intertwined with mental health problems, having witnessed substance misuse in the home, and so on. There's lots and lots of associated problems. And that's really important for us to identify and campaign on because it helps kind of tackle the idea that some people are just susceptible to addiction because of addictive substances appreciating that those substances do have addictive qualities, but it's very rarely just somebody has a susceptibility. The issue of gambling addiction has suddenly kind of emerged on our radar. It wasn't something that was really talked about us before, and not since the kind of recent May election. So we're kind of really interested in it now. But I guess what I was looking for is kind of some expert views from the panel about how is it that gambling addiction does interrelate with other social okay, issues. There's a lot of thoughts about those social comorbidity, I suppose we can name it. Okay, can I, before I go, I'm pretty Henry, I might be the first person to come about you, but others will have thoughts. Can I just check, as from the Police and Crime Commissioner perspective, how how is this issue, how are you seeing it from from the perspective of policing and crime? How, how, is, how is that showing up in your in your world? So, I mean, there's so many ways it's hard to be succinct, but I it's really hard. One, we're seeing that we're still kind of imprisoning far too many people that, quite frankly, just have multiple vulnerabilities and shouldn't be there. Some people might pose a risk to society but still need all sorts of help if they're going to be rehabilitated because the causes that got them there were a whole array of different social hardships. So we're looking at lots of ways of essentially, as again was alluded to, providing far more genuinely holistic responses. So that doesn't just mean bringing multiple agencies together in one room coming up with a plan and then sending a vulnerable person to multiple services it's much more combined effort and for a more compassionate therapeutic lens so we're thinking that expertise in how to tackle gamble, gambling addiction particularly when it integrates with other issues might be a specialism that we try and bring into these different contexts of multi-agency work but that's all in the idea stage because we don't yet really feel like we could understand how addiction kind of manifests. Yes, I'd be happy to, to start. On this. On yes. So um, you you make so many excellent points in terms of the coexistence of, 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 of complex complex experiences, um, and one of the things that I'd like to point people to, if you're not aware of it is that many years ago, already about 15 years ago, uh, a man called Judge Mark Farrell, Farrell in New York was running what we know of as the gambling courts. And what would happen there is there would be a diversion from a custodial sentence for anybody who was willing to give it a go. Um, it would require uh, enforced treatment for <coughs> gambling. Uh, but that was not the end of it, because as you can imagine, with any addiction, putting someone in for, you know, uh, in, into a, an inpatient unit for a while, getting them out and then leaving them to their own devices, that's not going to work. So, so what he did was that he had a cohort of people who had 
come through after the treatment. First of all, if they defaulted on treatment, they would end up in prison where they were heading in the first place. Um, outcomes were measured. They were done uh, in the way things were done maybe 20 years ago, so slightly differently from now. Now there would be an independent outcome monitoring system to understand cost per unit and value of investment and all of that. Then it was just them telling everyone that actually this worked extremely well. They ended up with um, extremely low relapse rates. And what they would do, it was a wraparound service. It was a holistic approach at a time when hardly anyone was delivering gambling disorder treatment. And if they were, it was really sort of GA stuff in those years. In the States, and in here, there was just very, very little. So, so I think what we know now, I, I sit on the uh, Crime and Problem Gambling Commission for the Howard League. We've been looking at all of this, and there will be uh, recommendations made uh, at some point in the near future about what we feel would work. But certainly, even from, uh, I was privileged enough to spend quite a lot of time with this, this judge, and, um, and it's very clear to me, even in those years, that he really understood that it's about 15 different elements, uh, not just uh, the vulnerability of the individual that play a part. Um, and and uh, the benefits to the family, to the children of these problem gambling, I, I don't like to use that term, but the, the children of the people with gambling disorder was phenomenal. And they ended up in employment and they were followed up for years, great stuff. So I, I think that the first thing to say is these things do exist. There are some running now in Nevada and it may be worthwhile linking up with that. Um, I certainly would very much like to see the first gambling court in this country in the next year or two. I think it's very easy to set up, um, and uh, you know we do call diversion for for substances, or you know, so why not? Um, uh, so so that's good. The second thing to say is that now in the prison services, we we we've got quite a lot of emerging gambling work. We're just beginning, certainly uh, Central and Northwest London, my trust is one of the biggest addictions trusts, well it's not just addictions but with a strong addictions component, um, has now got several prisons and we've got, we're employing psychologists on a regular basis to send them into, I'm training them up, they're going to these prisons, they're trying to identify um, problematic uh, people who have arrived because of gambling or who by chance have co-occurring co gambling and disorder as well as other things. Uh, what I will say, brings me back to the statutory levy, uh, we are not currently doing any of the objective evaluation, the high quality measuring that is needed to demonstrate need, to demonstrate effectiveness. But you, otherwise, all it is is one of us going to the papers and saying this works very well, you know, and then it's forgotten. We need to have measurable outcomes so these can be improved on year on year, repeated, and the understanding of that particular cohort of people can then be brought to improving uh, how else we reach the people we are not reaching. As we know, there are an enormous number of uh, gambling disorder people around who are not even coming onto our radar. Uh, so these are my two points, I suppose. Thank you very much, Andrew. Now, I have to, to, to Carol, I'll also just say a housekeeping point. We're about to get to the, what was supposed to be the, the allotted end of the <laughs> session, but um, uh, if it's all right with everybody here, we'll, actually, we'll go on for another 10 minutes or so to, to, to five, to five four. Yeah. You know, then we'll release, release Carol back in the world, go to our next, uh, uh, next Well, the world does not carry anything. So, uh, okay, yeah, but Karen, Carol Harris. Uh, thank you, thank you. So, um, I hear a lot from people who, um, for whatever reason, have ended up in the criminal justice system because of their gambling disorder. And some of them will be involved in another kind of addiction to, it's like a bit like self-medication. So they have a problem with gambling and they will use alcohol or drugs in order to cover up that or to, to make them feel better about the guilt they're feeling because of the gambling problem. I think a lot, Gambling is one of the, is probably for somebody who is suffering with an addiction, it doesn't present. You cannot see someone as a gambling problem. If you're an alcoholic or you're a drug, you've got a drug problem, then you were, people will know because of the way that you, you present. So it's probably the most hidden, and that's why people haven't talked about it. But I've talked to plenty of custody sergeants who say that when somebody comes in, for example, for domestic violence, when they actually trace that back, the reason domestic violence has occurred is because of the 
self anger at having lost a considerable amount of money and then taken that out on a partner um, in order just to cover the fact that they, they've you know, just lost everything. Um, I've also done quite a lot of work with people who've committed uh, crime or fraud and robbery in order to fund the gambling. And um, I, I mean, Robert Buckland is not the Justice Secretary anymore. So and, uh, prior to Robert actually leaving, I've done quite a lot of work with him as a DDS around the fact that the way that the CPS and the courts are set up doesn't really acknowledge the fact that somebody who, ste well, well, somebody who steals the gambling um, excuse me, excuse Sorry. me. Can we ask you to move down the hall, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. You get more ball shoot then. <laughs> um, so you very often you will find that there will be things like um, the company. Say for example, and I'm going to use a case which is quite recent. Really nice guy, never committed to crime in his life. Found himself in a position where he become. A get a, a, a serious gambling disorder was was gambling phenomenal amounts of money, and in order to do that, he was taking money from his company, putting it into his account. Uh, admitted to his company, he couldn't live with it anymore. Admitted to his company, he was doing that, um, and they went to the police quite naturally, and he was charged. Now, the company with, from whom he was stealing, I've only ever once done any kind of intervention. They asked to see his bank statements. Um, he was earning something like £2,000 a month. He was spending something like £15,000 a month. And on his bank statement, you'd see these, this money going in from his company. At no point did the, did the gambling company say, well, what's this money going in here? They saw his pay slip, they saw his bank statements, and they allowed him to carry on. And the only reason they'd done that is because he asked for them to stop him gambling. So they asked for evidence as to why you couldn't gamble anymore. And they actually said, and I've seen something which says, we're not gonna block your account because we know you'll miss it. So he carried on gambling and after he told his company, uh, the Gambler Commission got involved and they investigated. Now at no point was there a conversation between the Gambling Commission and the CPS as to the fact they would investigate him. So this guy goes to court despite the fact the company had been fined by the Gambling Commission and the company he worked for had been repaid the money, the CPS didn't know because there was no communication, so the CPS didn't tell the judge. So the judge sentenced him based on the um, original amount of money that had been stolen. Now nobody's saying that he should have got away with stealing the money. He knows that, he understands that. But along with a custodial sentence, comes what they call a POCO, which is proceeds of crime. Now the proceeds of crime is based on how much money has been stolen and how much of that money has been paid back. A huge chunk of what he'd stolen had been paid back, yet he's come out to prison with a POCO, which is relevant to the original amount of money that he's stolen. So as he's been inside, his marriage has broken up, not surprisingly. He's come out to prison and I was gonna to say to his wife, wife he's a pending divorce, we're gonna sell this house. Because if we don't sell this house where his wife and his children live, then I'm going to have to go back into prison for 18 months. So the work I've been trying to do is to get the courts to work with the CPS, to work with the police, to work with the Gambler Commission, so that everybody knows what's going on and they can say, hang on, this guy or this woman has got a problem, which is a psychological problem that needs treatment, which they're not going to get in prison. One of the interesting things he said to me is that there's a myth that there's like only one um, gambling addict in every prison. He was in prison and he, had, he, had, he actually was sharing accommodation with three other people who were there for stealing in order to fund their gambling, but had never told the court anything about that. So that is the issue we got. It's, it's, the crime is getting bigger, the solution is getting more diluted. So we need to get something more professional on that level. Thank you. Just, you know, just a quick, quick thought for Andy. Very quick. Some closing, closing questions before we're wrapping. We're, we're, we're turfed out of here by the next event. But uh, Matt, yeah, Matt and James, the, the, the diversion court in Nevada is, is run by uh, Cheryl Moss. I know her. If you want me to message me on Twitter, I'll put you in touch. I, I don't know if that's it. I'm interested. The, uh, the, thing, the thing that would make the biggest difference is the Gambling Commission needs to do 
the regulatory sanction yeah. before the issue goes to court because then the money gets paid back and the sentence is then lessened because the money's already been paid back by the operator because gambling with proceeds of crime is illegal. They shouldn't be doing, they shouldn't, that money has to be paid back anyway by the operators. So the gambling commission, what, what actually happens now is someone will nickel load money, gamble it away, they'll go to, go through, um, you know, go on trial, all that will happen. It will be reported in the news and then the gambling commission will go, oh, uh, we should probably find out, find out which operator that was. And then, and then they'll go, and then they'll sanction the operator off the back of the news story. Like that's how bad the gambling commission are, right? So, if the gambling commission did its job properly and it sanctioned the operators first, and the money was paid back as it's supposed to be, that would be much. But that would, I think, curtail a lot of this. That would solve a lot of these problems. Yeah, very um, <clears throat> briefly, just to pick up on something that Henrietta mentioned about the evidence base. I'm not going to proclaim on uh, the context for cause or comorbidity of addiction. That would be. Um, absurd, particularly when we have Professor Bowden Jones here. But I do want to say something about the evidence base or the lack of an evidence base and what that means for policy making. So the question was about the relationship between the causes of, of addiction. And there has been some work done on the relationship between the effects of addiction. And by that I mean the costs of gambling related harm. And the best known report on that was published by IPPR in, in 2016, and they uh, assessed the costs of gambling related harm on four main areas so, healthcare uh, providers, on uh, welfare and jobs, on, on housing and homelessness, and on the criminal justice system so, prisons and incarceration. And going through what those various costs look like, and sometimes the evidence was strong, sometimes it was less strong, they came out with a sort of general figure of how much gambling harm costs were. Economy and a figure really interesting 260 million pounds and 1.16 billion. Now, no criticism of the good people at IPPR, but from a policy making perspective, that's that there's nothing that can really be done with that, it's just too too wide. Uh, now, next week, we're anticipating that Public Health England are going to publish their long awaited report, which is going to look at the same question how much does gambling harm cost uh, the public? Um, in terms of its uh, consequence and effects on, on those, on those uh, areas. I'm hoping that PHG will um, come up with a figure which is a little tighter than that of IPPR in 2016. But if they don't, or if the methodology and the rationale behind their figures isn't as uh, structured as we might like it to be, then we're still in the same position where we don't have an evidence base. And I can't overstate how problematic that is from a policy making and a political perspective. It's very difficult to come up with sensible policies when you just don't know what the problem is and how much it costs. Thank you. Now, I'm going to try and get one, um, if you one last, well, I'm going to take two down there and there. If we can get both of you to the questions, comments, and the last round of responses from the panel, I'm just a bit concerned that we're going to be, uh, you know, someone's going to storm that door and get <laughs> on the um, So, So, uh, gentlemen, there, there, and then, Hi again, Mark Bennett, who was supposed to walk in. Uh, just really uh, ask the panel on the Caroline, um, in the issue of differentiating policy between different parts of the, the gambling sector, because from a charge lottery point of view, you know, the charge lottery sector itself is a £10 month um, subscription to Red Debit, uh, and maybe a part of the sector which, despite having that low risk factor, still takes problems down the sexual series. In terms of protecting our customers and its play also based cooperation tax. So it really creates a big difference between us and the larger sort of more risky. So how, how to differentiate? How to differentiate? Yeah, so the nine, the nine are unproblematic. Yeah. And uh, gentlemen there. Yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to ask more about politics rather than the policy. And I heard that you were, both James and Matt, were talking about that and about how uh, Matt was very quite positive <laughs> about what was going to come down the track. and. Tell your positivity, man. <laughs> so I just wonder what happens when everything's announced and it might not be the wish list that everyone on this panel might want. What happens then? How can Labour respond in a way which isn't like you know an ungrateful child? What 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 happens then? You know. So, so should we start with it with the more difficult question about different different types of government, but then go for closing thoughts on the that wider the, the wider politics of you. Know, uh, 
you know, is, is, the, is the argument one, and if it's not, what, what, what makes the life of so So, hang on, so what I'll start by saying is, I, I think I said this at the very beginning, I'm not anti-gambling. Um, with the postcode lottery and with all the health, well, with the charity lotteries, not the national lottery, with the, the, the charity lotteries, it's like you said, it's £10, it's once a month, it's a direct debit, um, and I believe that it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with it, because you can actually, um, it's controllable, you haven't got an online presence, you're not grooming people, you're not you know, targeting vulnerable people, and I firmly believe that when we do get a, a where if we get a statutory levy, it needs to be put into place. So those who are um, gaining the most need to pay the most. And you do a lot more good work. And I would argue you do a lot more good work than the National Lottery do. Because when you look at the National Lottery and how much money they're actually making from the online presence and the Insta games and the, the fact that they were allowing 16 euros to have accounts on there. And I've been very vocal about um, the national lottery. So for me, it's a completely different ball game. It's no, it's no more harsh than buying a, a raffle ticket in, in, you know, at an event when you win the postcode lottery. I've got no issue with that at all. And as you know, Mark, I'm more than happy to say that. Happily. I've got. I, I'm not averse to horse racing. I'd love to go to a horse track, <laughs> and everybody promises to take me, and then they get cold feet and won't take me. Everybody says, "Oh, me." To our horse track, I've seen the bloody invitation. I would love to go to the races. I might put a bet on. You know, I got nothing. That is not an issue. It's it's the stuff online which is really really pernicious. And to, to go to you, Charles, I would say um, if it's not what I want, then I can't speak for the Labour Party because I'm not you. I'm not representing the Labour Party. It's such a it's such a for me. It's a moral argument, and I'm speaking for myself, and I'm saying. Then you will hear my voice loud and clear, and I think you already know that. Um, would you say anything? We're coming on the types of gambling, maybe? Yeah. No, I, I, I would just like to support what Karen said. I think there's a critical mass. We have reached it, and we have sustained the need for change of that significant nature, and we won't be quiet about it. If it's not actually hearing what we need, we will insist that the, the job is not finished. I think as well, like you have to look at the rates of harm associated with each product, and like take online slots. Online slots generates more than fifty percent of gross revenue online, and there's no limits to the stakes. And if you look at the rates of problem and at-risk gambling for online slots, it's forty-five percent. Forty-five percent of the people that use them, and the lottery, it's lottery products because it's in free. It's um, infrequent the events aren't as free like basically the things you want to look, look out for for dangerous products are state and speed and if you have a high event frequency um, then you're going to have a more addictive product lottery is by its nature not high event frequency so you have lower much lower rates of addiction even though you have higher rates of participation um, on the politics uh, I mean look the, the, the Tories put the review in the manifesto they um, obviously Followed through with the review and made it very broad. They didn't, it's, you know, this is not a box to exercise. Look at the call for evidence, very, very broad. There are people in government who are taking this very seriously. Um, they see it as an opportunity. There's, it's very popular, as I mentioned, and um, obviously everyone knows where Carolyn stands, and that's and the APPG. And if it does, if the white paper falls short, they're, they're well within their rights, I think, to um, to respond to that. Uh, uh, by outlining where it does fall short, it'd be very difficult for the Labour Party to respond as a party if it doesn't say where it stands now, because that's when you just get this kind of exact. I think the allegory you used was spoiled child or whatever, or ungrateful child. Yeah, uh, and the other thing would be like it's where the Captain Hindsight come, stuff comes from. It's like you know you didn't say this before, so sorry, Karen. <laughs> um, so they need to say it now. They need to say it now, and it's all their policies, anyway. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Jamie, last, last word from this. Yeah, very quickly on the on the oh. political question. I, I, I'm going to so quick to talk about the sectoral difference <coughs> between remote and land-based gambling, which I think what the question was essentially about. Um, if if there are omissions, come the white paper. Uh, I think the first question that that, that that we have to ask in a kind of grown-up sort of way is. Are those omissions because of the evidence base, uh, or have they been made because of 
uh, political pressure and, and lobbying, which unfortunately we've seen an enormous amount of, a destructive amount of, over the last, the last few months. Um, when it comes to, to determining the answer to that question, um, if, if it's the first, if, if it's about the evidence, and this is meant to be an evidence-based process, then there is an opportunity of the white paper for there to be another consultative process. So those questions will be uh, made again, and responses can be given to those uh, questions ahead of any potential changes to legislation or, or regulation. The evidence base has to be at the forefront of of all of our minds, and I, I'm, I'm confident that we can continue to make our case when it comes to that process. So I mentioned, for example, the question of the statutory levy and this myth that the government doesn't like hypothecated taxation. Well, there will be an opportunity to make that case uh, following the white paper. So it has to be evidence-based. But I would like to end, I suppose, with just one observation, uh, which is too, too much of this strays from the consideration of the evidence base to something which, for me, feels a bit like a kind of win-lose situation. Are we going to win the argument and defeat the enemy, or are they going to defeat us and we're going to lose? And I think that's a culture which, I'm afraid to say, has been introduced by the, the gambling industry, and particularly by the gambling industry's lobbyists. I'm sure you'll be familiar with who and what I'm talking about here without naming names. And I feel that the gambling industry, when it does that, behaves very much like, like a gambler. So we saw that the Fonty campaign, and that one was better than anyone. It's like, okay, we don't want two. We're not going to stick with them twist. We're going to hold out till we get 10, 20, 30. It's like, what's optimal for our, for our commercial um, benefit? And I think what the industry have to come to the table with isn't some kind of gambler's mentality of how much we're prepared to lose and how much we want to win. But where is their evidence base? when it comes to that white paper. So for example, the question of affordability, which I you know, got criticised for last year. Fine, go ahead and criticise the £100 soft cap recommendation. I provided a series of evidence to justify that recommendation. I ran the numbers, there were researchers involved in that. And when the response from the industry is, yeah, the £100 just feels a bit low. It feels like you know, it's being any status. We're, we're between you and me, James. We'd be willing to go with the 500 Right, or 250 or 1,000, but 100 pounds feels better. That's not good enough. So, my answer to your question is come to my paper, there'll be another round of consultation. It has to, has to be evidence based and not due to political pressure. And we all wait for the industry and the industry lobbyists to come to the table with their evidence, and then we can look at which argument is the stronger.